Okay, so like I said last time, um, we just finished the first half of the, um, you know, all the material before midterm. And the second half of the, you know, like second half of the first half of the midterm is about wave and oscillations. So that's going to be the topic for us for the next three weeks. Okay. And then we're going to have the midterm. So it's kind of like a uh, gear switching kind of topic because it's probably not going to mention anything related to heat uh, entropy or that stuff that we did. Okay, so it's kind of a brand new topic here. Okay, the goal of this section is to study wave and there are many kind of wave like sound wave, light wave, electromagnetic wave, but all of that um, has kind of the same conceptually um, conceptual starting point which is oscillations okay and this actually should have been in the syllabus for the first semester of your physics course but I think it's too packed so we didn't put it there um, but putting it here is kind of I think appropriate because it's a good introduction to wave um, what I'm showing here is of course a simulation that you can go and try for yourself. I put the link in the chat. Okay, so I think if you join the class later, you can access the um, URL. I think that should be okay. If not, I can send it again. But um, or you can just Google like PHET, which is a uh, physics. ET, I think it's like education and maybe technology or something like that. So this is a simulation um, from a research group in, I think, University of Colorado in the US, where um, they try to put um, as many experiments in the form of web um, simulation, because obviously you probably know that to do this in real life, you at least need quite um, a lot of equipment to to do everything right so um, <clears throat> and also it's quite appropriate for the online format that we are doing right now okay so what do we have here um, we have two springs and you can just put the mass onto the spring and then here I'm holding onto the mass right so it's just not moving much unless I move my hand or my stylus but if I release my hand here it's gonna start oscillating like this up and down okay um, how fast it's oscillating depends on a few things in this case it depends on how heavy the mass I put in so this one is 100 grams it's gonna oscillate faster if I put in less mass okay it's gonna oscillate slower if I put larger mass okay and for the same mass there's one parameter which kind of characterize the stiffness of the spring which is called the spring constant which is this slider I can just move around right so if the spring is really stiff, then it's going to oscillate really fast like this. If the spring constant is small, then it's going to oscillate slower like this. Okay, so <clears throat> how fast or how slow the oscillation is, um, we're going to use the term frequency. And I gonna everything I say is going to be defined like more rigorously after I switch to the, um, you know, tablet writing like the lecture note um, but we use the term frequency to tell how fast it's oscillating so oscillating fast means the frequency is high okay so frequency is just telling you how many oscillations you have per second right so if you take or well, this one even have a stopwatch for you yes so if you time right and then you see every second how many oscillations you're gonna have 
And what do I mean by oscillation? Well, oscillation means you complete one round of the motion. So if you start from up here, one oscillation is going down and then back up. That's one. Okay. So in one second, if you have, let's say, two oscillations, like one and then two, and that's exactly one second. So that's two oscillations per second. So the frequency will be two hertz. Okay, so the frequency is the one that we're going to use very frequently. Um, you can also use period. Period is just one over the frequency. Period is how long does it take for one round of oscillation to complete. Right? So you can see that if you have a really fast oscillation, right, it doesn't take long for the object to complete one oscillation. So fast oscillation means small period, okay? A really long period means it takes a long time and then back up here. So really long period means it's oscillating um, slowly, so low frequency, okay? So frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So F equal to one over the period. Okay, and then <clears throat> the other thing that we will be talking about is the amplitude of the oscillation. So you're going to see later that um, the amplitude of the oscillation is essentially um, how much it's moving. So if you have the spring which is oscillating only like tiny bit like this, then the amplitude is small. But if you have it oscillating a lot like this, then the amplitude is high, right? So the amplitude is essentially the um, the the distance in which you measure from the center, right? So you can see that I'm toggling this line, which is called the mass equilibrium line. That's the line where um, the spring is not stretched or compressed. So it's the center line, if you may, right? And the amplitude is essentially just how far away it is from the center line at the lowest point and the highest point, okay? So this will be, uh, sorry, I'm trying to catch it. So this will be a small amplitude, right? Because it doesn't move away that much from the center line. And this will be a large amplitude, right? Because it's moving um, really a lot from the center line, okay? And if you, um, later on, if you have time, you can go and then play with other things. For example, you can also show the energy of the oscillation, right? And then you can see that um, you have exchange of energy between Ke, which is kinetic energy, and potential energy. And this one even includes the energy loss due to damping, right? So you can change it to none and then you're gonna have the exchange of energy and this oscillation will just go on forever because you don't have any loss in the energy so that's the thing called damping here so if you increase the damping then the oscillation gonna stop after only a few um, you know cycle of the oscillation because you lose energy every time you move so if the damping is, you know, moderate, not that much or not that small, then you get a few oscillation bef before it stops doing that, okay? Um, so we, we're not going to um, spend too much time mathematically describing damping oscillation, damp oscillation, but um, I'm going to show, like, kind of quanti qualitatively, like, how it looks like, okay? But anyway, that's kind of, like, the whole theme of today's, um, lecture and I warn you that there's going to be a few um, you know mathematical calculation involved calculus so if you um, a little bit rusty on calculus then you can um, let me know or even better you can um, review it yourself later okay but I'm trying to go um, as 
slow as possible and then as clear as possible. Okay? All right, so our goal today is to describe this kind of motion. That's the goal for today. So let me switch to, um, let's see, today's lecture, lecture six. <coughs> So let's uh, lecture six again is about oscillation. We're not talking about wave yet, okay? So wave is gonna be kind of like the the next step from oscillation. So what we're gonna talk about today is of course um, the simplest oscillation, which is called simple harmonic motion. Okay. And then we're gonna talk about a few conceptual um, thing, which is very important also later on when we talk about wave, which is the notion of amplitude phase frequency angular frequency and period. Okay, so by the end of this lecture, you should know what these um, words means. And then we're gonna talk about two, um, well, we're gonna talk about one system, but if we have enough time, we're gonna talk about the other one, um, which is mass and spring system. That's one. And then the other one is, um, simple pendulum okay so these two are kind of very basic oscillating system that we're gonna study here and the last topic is damp and force oscillation okay again we're not gonna spend too much time for those two and we're gonna talk only you know qualitatively about damp and force oscillation okay so the first thing we probably need to try to describe is how the um, the mass move the mass and spring the one in the simulation that I just showed you right so let's be a little bit more systematic so i'm gonna draw it though not as nicely compared to the simulation so we have a spring and then we have mass like this okay and the spring is characterized by the spring constant k okay so let's reveal what this means so spring obeys what we call Hooke's law. Okay, Hooke's law. What is Hooke's law? Hooke's law essentially tells you that if you want to stretch the spring by, let's say, this much, let's say I want to stretch the spring so that the spring get extended by this much, okay, how much force do you need to pull it, right? So the amount of force, and I'm gonna put the absolute sign for now, and then we're gonna talk about the, um, the sign later. But let's just talk about the absolute sign here, absolute sign of the force, which is just the magnitude of the force. The magnitude of the force depends on how much you pull down. Okay, so, sorry. So again, this is the proportionality um, symbol. Okay, so F is proportional to, to X. And this X is this X here. And again, this line here is called the equilibrium line. So that's the location of the spring and the mass 
when it's not moving and it's not stretched or compressed or anything okay and in this case let's just as assume that we don't have like gravity in it so there's no uh, weight mg pulling down um, it's not going to change much but just to make things simplest as simplest as we can then let's ignore gravity okay so this is the equilibrium location of the mass we also going to call this spring to be at natural length Natural length means the spring is neither compressed nor stretch. Okay, so it's a very happy spring because there's no stress or anything <coughs> in it. So the natural length of the spring is when the the end of the spring or the where we put the mass is at the equilibrium point, which is this line in the center here. Okay, and now we want to pull the spring down, and we pull it by this much, and it's given by this displacement. Okay, so the more displacement you want for the spring, essentially the um, greater the stretch distance, then you need to apply more force, right? So you need to pull it down. So this is the force that you need to pull down, right? And this force is the force that appear on this equation, okay? So it's the proportionality um, kind of relation. So that means I can turn this into an equation by introducing a constant. So from this, I can just say, Let's turn this into an equation. So instead of the proportionality um, symbol, I can just say that it's equal to k times x, like this. Okay, and this is a this is what we call a spring constant, which is a constant that characterizes the stiffness of a spring. So high spring constant or large spring constant, that spring is very stiff, meaning that it's very hard to compress, it's very hard to pull. When you have a small spring constant that is very weak spring, a soft spring, so it's very easy to compress, very easy to stretch. Okay, So any spring, at least in the ideal case, um, the only thing that characterizes what kind of spring you have is just the value of k. All right, so <clears throat> now let's remove this absolute sign. Okay, and this is where we have to be a little bit more careful because the force here in this equation, so let me rewrite it down here. So F equal to k times the absolute value of the displacement here. So if we want this F to be the force by the spring, okay, not the force from us, it's the force by the spring. So instead of talking about the force that you need to pull it down in order to stretch it, we talk about the force by the spring. So it should be kind of like intuitive to all of you that the force of the spring is gonna be pulling up. Okay, so the spring will try to, will try to pull back to the equilibrium position, right? So that means if you have the displacement going down, the force of the spring will be pointing up. On the other hand, if you have a different situation, where you try to compress the spring, meaning that you want to push it up like this. Okay, the displacement now switch the sign because you go up, right? So x point up, but now the spring will try to push back. So the force will be pushing down like this. Okay, so if we talk about force by the spring, you can see that 
the force is always pointing in the opposite direction from the displacement. Okay, so displacement going down force from the spring or by the spring is pointing up and when you compress it up, x pointing up then force is pointing down, right? So that's why when you want to remove this absolute sign here, that means now you care about the direction. Okay, so how do you capture that reverse of sign for the force rela um, relative to displacement? So you just put a minus sign. Okay, so after you remove the absolute sign, then you need to put a minus sign here. And then K, and then X. And this is what we call Hooke's law. F equal to minus K. So again, minus sign is there just to remind you that the force direction and the displacement direction is always opposite from each other. Not having a minus sign is actually a totally different story. It means that if you pull the spring down from the equilibrium, right? So let's say equilibrium is here. So you pull it down. Displacement is pointing down like this. And if you don't have the minus sign here, that means the force by the spring is also pulling down, right? Which is really strange because if the force from the spring is pulling down, then the mass will tend to be go down even further. So actually you have like a runaway system, like totally unstable because um, the sign is wrong essentially. So the minus sign is actually very important. Okay, so if you want to keep everything as vectors, then the minus sign has to be there. And again, the meaning of that is just to tell you the relative direction of the force by the spring to the displacement vector, which is x in our case. Okay, so this is Hooke's law, and this is um, you know, true for any spring. And from this, we can actually, if we want, solve the equation of motion using Newton's law, and then you're gonna get the oscillatory solution to um, Newton's law. Okay, but um, doing so is a little bit too mathematical intensive. So we're gonna do a different approach and then we're gonna kind of like do a roundabout and then later on we're gonna come back to this equation, right, instead of directly going to the solution from this equation. All right, so we're gonna um, leave this equation alone for a few moment and then come back later. So let's now try to describe um, how the mass gonna move, right? So in order to do so, it's probably a good idea to plot some graph. So the graph we're gonna plot is a graph of uh, displacement and time. So we're gonna have displacement of the mass, which depends on time, and then time, okay? So how do we do that? Well, let's say the mass starts from the top of the oscillation motion. So let's say, so I'm gonna draw a few kind of situation. So let's say at t equal to zero, the mass is at the top. And then some later time it start to fall down and then down again and then back up, and then back up to the highest point again, okay? So it's kind of like the simulation that we saw earlier and then we're trying to take a, a picture at every second or every half a second, something like that, okay? And then let's assume that this line here, that's the equilibrium point or line. Right? So that's where x is equal to zero meaning that the spring is not stretched or compressed, right? So x equal to zero. So at the beginning, 
the mass is at the highest possible point from the red line. And this distance here is called the amplitude. So it's going to go up A, and then it's going to go down by A, the same amount. That's the amplitude. So amplitude is the maximum displacement from the center, from the equilibrium point, in either direction, so it up or down. So if we were to plot this, um, you know, motion on this graph, it's going to look something like this. So it's going to start off somewhere here, and then comes down here and then reach the bottom and then back up again and then just keep going like this okay so i'm trying to draw like a cosine graph very badly it's not like i'm trying to draw it badly i'm trying to draw it well but it just comes out badly but in any case it should look like a cosine graph uh, how do we know that it's a cosine well we don't know yet at this point um, but um, since I know what the solution going to be, um, so we, you can also say that, okay, from the experimental um, fact, we know that it's a cosine um, graph for this uh, motion. So it's going to start off at A, and it's going to go down to minus A. Right? So I put a minus sign for... A here because it's lower than the red line right so the sign also telling you um, which side of the mass is relative to this center line here so if you have positive displacement that means the mass is above this red line if it's negative then it's um, beneath this red line okay so that's the amplitude and ideally, if you don't lose any energy, um, and of course, ideally, because in real life, you're going to lose energy. <coughs> Let's say you don't lose any energy, then the graph will look like this forever until the end of time. Right? So if you wait long enough, then it's going to keep going and going. So the amplitude will stay the same um, until you know, the end of time. Okay. But if you have any loss in the energy, then the amplitude will slowly decrease. And that's going to be what we call damp oscillation. So we're going to talk about that um, by the end of this lecture. OK, so let's try to pinpoint a few other things on this graph. So remember that we can say the you know, how fast or how slow the oscillation is by using the term frequency or the period. Since we are plotting this with the time as the horizontal axis, it's probably better if we talk about the period. Okay, so what's the period? The period is the time it takes to complete one oscillation. So if you start here, it's going to go down. So it's going to go down, right? and then back up. So we say it's complete one period when it's back to the original position. So it's back to here. That's one cycle of oscillation. How long does it take? That's the period. So on the time axis, we start from t equal to zero. So this is where we call one period. And the period is usually used by the big T to indicate a period, okay? So T is a period for this oscillation. So it's the time required to go back to the original position. So that means if I extend the graph a little bit further, right, the time it takes from this point to this point again, which is another cycle, that's going to be another period. So in that case, here it's going to be 2t, right? So every cycle you're going to have um, passed the time by one period. So it's going to be one period, 1t, 2t, 3t, 4t, so on and so forth. Okay? All right. 
so everything is fine but let's really try to write down the equation of like the motion for not the equation of motion like the mathematical form of x right and for now i gonna not bother writing down the vector sign here but let's try to remember that it's really a displacement right so in principle the vector sign should be there but anyway x of t equal to something and that something has to match the graphical representation here right so at least we know that it's a cosine function because a cosine function is the one that starts from the top and then go down and then like this right so it has to be cosine of something and usually you say it's a cosine of the horizontal variable right usually you're used to cosine of x or something like that but in this case our horizontal direction uh, dire horizontal um, axis is given by time so it has to be cosine of something which is related to time but it's not directly time we have to multiply by something here and that's what we are trying to figure out and also we need to multiply by something here right so the thing in front is easy because cosine has the amplitude of one right because it starts from one and then goes down to minus one and then comes back to one but we have the motion start from a and then goes to minus a so the amplitude is a so how do we get that well just by multiplying a in front of cosine like this okay so that takes care of the thing in front rather straightforwardly and then well what do we do here well for sine or cosine function right we know that um, if we add something to it it gonna look exactly the same so what do I mean by that so let's say you are dealing with you know a uh, regular mathematics function which is cosine of um, x okay so not to be confused with this x maybe I'm gonna use different notation let's use set here okay so set is just any variable it's the thing that you put in your calculator right cosine of 10 degrees cosine of 5 degrees or something like that or in radian right so for cosine if you add another 2 pi to it like this right it gonna look the same right so if that is the angle in radians then if you add 2 pi to your set then the value is going to be the same right this is the property of what we call a periodic function because you can add 2 pi it looks the same so you add another 2 pi it also looks the same so if you add another multiple of 2 pi like 4 pi 6 pi or something like that then also looks the same okay so that's what we have here <clears throat> okay so how do we use this to figure out what kind of multiplying in front there in this graph here what we saw earlier is that if you increment time by one period everything looks the same that's the definition of a period right a period is the time it takes to complete one cycle but the thing about this cosine function is that after one cycle everything looks exactly the same right so what we want is this we want x of t and then when you add the period to it it looks the same as before this is what we want what it should be 
okay? And it's the same kind of argument compared to the cosine function. Okay, so again, for cosine function, you add two pi to your argument. The value of the function looks the same. For the oscillation, the graph that we have here, if you add the time, which is the horizontal axis by one period, everything gonna look the same. Okay, so this is what we want. This line here, this property here. So let's try to kind of conform the form of x into this constraint, right? So I'm gonna copy that here. So x of t, again, we know that it's a times cosine. And we don't know what is multiplying in front. Let's just call it a because I don't want to um, use um, kind of like a blank as a placeholder here. So that's a quick question here, like why do we use cosine instead of sine? Um, no particular reason, you can also use sine. It works also equally well. Um, I'm just choosing this one because I think this one kind of mathemat mathematically and virtually is easier to, to understand, right? But you can repeat everything using sine, right? So there's no particular, um, you know, there's, there's nothing special about cosine. All right, so that should answer your question, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then again, we want to figure out this small a, and what we want is we want x of t plus big T equal to x of t. Right, this is what we want. So let's try to do that in this equation. So the first equation gives you that x of t plus big T equal to a cosine of small a, the thing that we are trying to figure out, times t plus big T here. Okay, so I'm just replacing t with big T. And then I might apply out everything inside the cosine bracket here. So I have a times t plus a small a times big T. And comparing this to this, right, remember that if you want the cosine to the cosine term to stay the same. The only thing that you are allowed to do is to add two pi to it. And nothing else. It cannot be, you know, one pi, it cannot be half a pi or something like that. This has to be two pi, right? So if we look at these two equations and then try to kind of compare them, then this can be this thing, right? The yellow thing uh, together, and the green thing is this one. So essentially what we are trying to do is we are trying to add something to this one, and then we want this to look the same as the first line. So the only thing that can happen is this green thing is exactly equal to two pi, right? By this equation here. So that just means a times t must be equal to 2 pi. So that means a, which is the thing that we always wanted, is simply 2 pi divided by the period big T. Okay, so this is what we want. So in other words, if a is equal to this, then when you increment time, by one period, the whole thing looks exactly the same, which is what we want. So in other words, we have figured out everything that we wanted. So x of t 
is fully described by this expression a cosine of 2 pi over the period big P times time which is the variable time right and then that's gonna describe graphically this one okay so the important thing here is that this term inside cosine it has to be such that um, when you increment time by one period everything must be looking the same right so you need to have some kind of conversion factor to convert time to the radian 2 pi the angle 2 pi radian here right because inside cosine or inside sine you cannot have any quantity which has you know the unit which is not radian okay so let me write that down so cosine or sine of anything inside here in physics okay the thing inside here must be or must have a unit of radian which in physics radian means no unit okay because remember how do we define radian radian is defined to be so we need a circle so what's the radian radian is defined to be the arc length along the circle divided by the radius okay so theta equal to s over r so you can see well you have studied enough physics to see that s is in distance in meter r is also a distance which is the radius right so you can see that distance cancel with distance so this angle which we call radian is actually a quantity which has no unit in physics and that has to be the case for the argument in sine or cosine function inside you should not have any unit okay so that's why you cannot just have like time appearing alone because what is cosine of one second that doesn't really make sense so you need to divide it out by the period which is also a quantity in the unit of time right so this time and this time the unit cancel out and everything is fine okay so I hope so far everything is clear um, <clears throat> the thing is that in physics we try to avoid writing one over something as much as possible because it's just make um, equation a little bit maybe not as nice so most of the time we're gonna write the frequency instead so again frequency f frequency is 1 over the period okay which is what we're going to use f for so that means I can rewrite the equation above to be a cosine and then 1 over big T becomes just f so 2 pi stays and then f and then t okay this dot is just the multiplication I don't need it there but I have written it down already so that's that's fine so these two are exactly the same thing one is in using period and the other one is using frequency okay so frequency is one over the period so the unit is one over second <coughs> so sometimes one over second <coughs> is called hertz so the unit of f is 1 over second or hertz right so you are used to you know like the wi-fi frequency of 4.2 gigahertz or something like that it's the same thing right that's just a really really high frequency or the frequency of the radio station like 100 megahertz right it's just it's oscillating 100 million times in one second so it's very high frequency also okay so 
Another thing which we gonna introduce is the term which we call angular frequency. And it's just the way for physicists to make things as short as possible. So this whole thing here, 2 pi f, we're gonna replace it with omega, right? And this omega is kind of the same thing as the omega that you saw in the first semester of physics for circular motion. So remember what this omega is called angular velocity. So it's actually how fast you are rotating, how fast you are turning, right? But in this case, it's not, well, nothing is rotating because the mass is oscillating up and down, right? So what are we talking about here? What is rotating? Is the angle in this argument that is rotating, right? So you can, um, I'm gonna come back to this point later, but you can see that a cosine of something here is very closely related to a circle that we talk about here, right? So omega appears here because the thing which is rotating is the angle in this cosine function. But in any case, at this point, you can think of this as like another shorthand to make the equation as short as possible. But I'm gonna write down omega here. This is called angular frequency. Okay, instead of angular velocity, because this is to prevent um, uh, confusion to, you know, like the circular motion. So instead of calling it angular velocity, we call it angular frequency here. And it's given by two pi f, right? So omega and f is the same thing that differ only by a two pi factor, okay? But the thing that you need to remember is that the unit of omega is not hertz, but it's actually radian per second. Okay, so be a little bit careful about the unit. If you say hertz, then it's always, always going to be the unit of F, not omega. Okay, so hertz is reserved only for F here. And if you want omega, then you just multiply by 2 pi. Okay, so it's a little bit kind of, you know, annoying in terms of like how the unit work out. But it's, if you're not paying attention, then things can be quite confusing. Anyway, um, by introducing omega, then I can again rewrite x of t to be very, very short now cosine omega t, like this. Okay, this is very simple, okay? And it captures everything you need to know for the oscillatory motion in this case. All right, um, before I continue, let's go back to this graph here. And let's say this is kind of related to what um, Brandon asked earlier about like, why do we use cosine instead of sine? Well, I use cosine because we start from the top, but you don't have to, you don't have to do that, right? You start from the top because I just call that particular time to be zero. So what you can do is you can call a different time to be zero, essentially by shifting the horizontal axis, right? So you can do uh, the new graph that explain the same motion, but now you start at a slightly different time. So instead of starting there, you can start here. And everything will be the same. Well, I'm really bad at drawing this. So maybe I just draw like a sine curve, something like this, right? Something like this, okay? So the green one is explaining the same motion, just different starting point in time. Okay, everything is the same. The period is the same. The frequency is the same, right? But um, now it's not cosine anymore. That should be obvious. Now instead it looks like sine, but sine and cosine is kind of like two extreme case. So you can have also anything in between. So you can have like something that start from here and then going like that. 
So you should have kind of like uh, freedom in picking what's your starting point. And in terms of the function here, it's gonna appear in the form of, so I'm gonna arbitrary starting time, starting point in time. So that means we have to add what we call the initial starting point. So we're going to do that by introducing this variable, which is phi. Okay, so it's a circle with kind of like a line going through it. Right, so this is called phi. And in physics, we call this a starting phase angle. Okay, starting phase angle phi here. So in our case, the original graph here is when the starting phase is zero because that's what we have, right? But if you have like the graph which is signed, right, you can keep the function to be cosine, but then here you probably need to add like a minus pi over two to it for the starting point, okay? So this is just for complete completeness. Um, we probably don't need to keep this phi every time we write down because um, it just makes everything longer, unnecessarily longer, right? So at for the rest of this lecture, we're gonna say, so let's set phi equal to zero just for simplicity. Okay, but just remember that you also have this freedom to choose any file you want to match your situation. Okay, so that means we're gonna use this as our x function for x. All right, now we're gonna do a little bit of calculus. So we have x which describes the location of our mass, right? So the next thing that we can calculate is the velocity of the mass itself. So how do we do that? So let me go to the next page here. So we have the displacement, which is x of t, again, equal to a cosine omega t and again we chose the phase starting phase the phase angle phi to be zero okay again you don't have to but um, it does not make any difference so we're gonna keep it equal to zero here so next we want to find the velocity which is how fast the mass is moving and you can see that the velocity sometimes is high sometimes is low at the top and at the bottom, when it's turning around, the velocity is zero, okay? So how do we describe that mathematically? Well, if you have displacement, velocity is just the derivative of x of t, okay? So some of you might not be that familiar with this expression because in physics one, um, you might not see this because I mean, it's non-calculus based. But you have taken calculus before. Um, so this is just a normal differentiation, right? But the thing is that our function of x of t is a little bit complicated, right? Because it involves a lot of constant, at least these two, right? So some of the rule that you learn from differentiation have to be used here. So the first thing is that any constant can be taken in front of the differentiation. So I can take a here in front. And then I have d by dt of, or well, let's just put a parenthesis here to be clear. Okay, so t is the variable that we are trying to differentiate with respect to. But unfortunately, 
it's not just T appearing, it's also omega appearing. So you have to use the chain rule to tackle this, right? So instead of just differentiating with respect to T, you differentiate with respect to omega T and then cosine omega t and then multiply by d omega t by dt okay so it's a very simple case of, of chain rule right so if you're confused you can also redefine omega t to be other variable maybe y or something right but in any case this is what we have here so you need now to differentiation so the first one is differentiation of cosine well if you don't remember then you can just open the differentiation table and then you can see that this gives you minus sine of omega t and the second term is easy because omega is actually just a constant right so differentiating constant times t by dt you just get omega so this term just give you omega like this so all together you have the velocity from uh, direct differentiation of the displacement it's going to be minus and they're going to put omega in front and then a and then sine omega t okay so this one is the velocity given that the displacement is given by a cosine omega t okay well that's not the end because we can do another differentiation and get the acceleration so the acceleration is again equal to d by dt well usually we call a right so a of t equal to d by dt of the velocity okay and since this is the second time you have done this I'm gonna skip and just write down the final answer right but just make sure that you understand like why you get this so you're gonna get minus omega square right another factor of omega by coming from another chain rule application of chain rule and then a and then sine goes back to cosine omega t like this okay again make sure that you understand why um, this is the case so I show you only the the result here okay so that's quite a lot of mathematics right so maybe it's a good time to take a quick break and Again, I'm going to set the timer to 10 minutes, and then we come back later. Okay? All right, see you in 10 minutes.